That's all right. So um, after the third question I had today about the flower pot problem, I figure maybe I should talk about it. So let's talk about the flower pot problem. Flower pot problem. Now, um, on the people I talked to, I showed two of you, I think, uh, an inferior solution to the third one of you are on a solution of their own, and I like it better than mine. So, I want to show you all three, two, anyway, here it goes. So, basically, the first problem with this problem is figure out what on earth is talking about. So, let me just add some, a little bit more context. And I'm going to change the flower pot to a cat. So, um, <laughs> we got some root. All right, and then below the roof, we got some window. All right. And um, for the convenience of our exposition, we're going to take um, the downward direction as positive, because everything is falling in this problem. We might as well make everything positive. My apologies to those of you who had downward negative. I mean, whatever, push both. Anyway, so the point is, in this problem, in your website, um, you're given um, something falls off the roof, like just make it a cat, roughly illustrated as such. <laughs> you, you kick, kick, and then the cat falls. All right. So then, <laughs> and then the cat's falling past this window. Um, oh, we bound the bound the feet of the cat. That whole thing about landing. <laughs> we duct taped it before we kick. I mean, just to say. Just so we're clear, the cat will be hurt. What did it be? So there are, there are really, um, there are really two velocities of interest here. There's this velocity, which I'll just not even give a name to. Um, velocity in, at the start, which was what? Zero meters per second, because although we get the kick, we just we don't really kick it down, we just kind of nudge, nudge it off the side. Which doesn't take much again because it's conducting. Um, and then you've got the speed it has when it's uh, here, which we could call d naught, right? And then as it's passing the window, as you're watching uh, The Voice or American Idol or whatever it is that you watch, I don't know. Sorry, you guys are like your age, right? So you don't watch TV, right? Watch Netflix. 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 Oh yeah. No, that's that cost money. Um, okay, so the not the the, the the speed as it's the instantaneous force velocity as it's, as it's just passing the window. All right, what information you're given? Well, there's two pieces of information that you're given in this problem. One is the height of the window. All right, which I'll call delta y. So you're given this now. For some of you. For some of you, that's like two meters, all right? Some of you, it's like 1.7. Anyway, that, that number's given to you. And then the other thing you're given is that this time, that between here, it takes a delta t of some given duration. So it could be like 0.434 seconds, or, or et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I don't want to do this for specific numbers so much, but that's, that's also given, all right? Um, then the question is what? The question is how far above the window was the cat nudged off the roof, right? Or how far did the flower how far above the window was the flower pot pushed off the sill? Same same question. Slightly less interesting. Um, so we're really interested in particular in this distance here, which we can call D, right? Now um, the solution that was shown to me by one of you essentially is as follows. Let's read that one to start with. So we can look at the kinematic equation. Um, make this t equals to zero if you want. And so if I do the kinematic equations from, from the cat the top of the window to the cat the bottom of the window, what I have is, well, let's see here, what do I have? I've got uh, something like delta y is equal to, what is it equal to? Well, it's given, but it's also equal to v naught times the time it takes for the for the cat to go past the window, right? V naught plus delta t plus one half g delta t squared. <clears throat> okay, but you're you're given. I mean, we're assuming that this is on Earth, so we know g is 9.8 meters per second squared. 
Um, you're given delta y, you're given delta t, right? So you can solve this for v not explicitly a number, right? One equation, the only unknown there is v not. Then what? What am I after? I'm after d. Then that can turn into the v final for the distance from the root to the top of the window. Ah, right. So v not, v not is the final velocity. Um, well, let's, the timeless equation, let's say, use timeless equation um, for. I need some. I need some. Uh, you know. I need some labels. So, for lack of imagination, I would call this point star, and this point star star. <laughs> okay. So use the timeless equation for the motion um, from star to star star. Most of the time you guys never write down these kinds of sentences, you just write down the equation, and then through my clairvoyance, I'm supposed to know that that equation was about that, right? I mean, that's my typical, that's my suffering and grading. Your work is no one ever explains what they're doing, they just do it. So, eventually you give me an answer, so I have something to judge on. I mean, I also try to grade work, but sometimes it's really hard. Okay, um, <clears throat> so here, What's the initial velocity? The final velocity, again, is v naught. So vf squared is actually v naught squared here. The timeless equation, remember, generically speaking, is vf squared equals v naught squared plus 2a delta x, right? Except that the v naught, this is, the, this is v naught squared. This is 0. And um, we have 2g delta y. Not delta y, but in this case, d. So again, v naught squared is equal to 2 times g times d. Hey, and then you're done, because you can solve for d. Solve for d. <clears throat> right? I found a more complicated way to solve this for one or two of you in office hours before now. So, that solution's not wrong, but it's Okay, what, did, what didn't I use here? Did you notice? Yeah. Yeah. We never, we didn't even need to know that final velocity. All we needed to know was delta y to delta t. But then we don't know how it comes here. You know, conversely, guys, if you think about it, you could take away one of these pieces of information if they gave you, I mean, there's too much information here, really. I could I could give you the V out, V not, and the V out, right? And I could either I could take away your delta y maybe, or I could take away your delta t, I think, and I'd still be able to solve this problem. Because if I took away one of those, I could still figure out if I if I had V not and I had V out, right? The thing is, V out minus V not is equal to what? It's equal to g times the change in t, right? So you see, if I if I have Vf and I have V naught, I don't need the delta t because I can figure it out. Conversely, if you give me delta t and either one of these, I can figure out the other one. So in this problem, you really have an embarrassment of riches. I mean, he's giving you they're giving you more than you need to solve the flower pot problem. It's not the meanest version of the flower pot problem that you could ask. All that we're given though is the the, dis the height of the window at the time. Yes, my point is, but, oh, but weren't you also given these? No. 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 Oh! Oh, it's already be enough then. Never mind. I'm an idiot. Okay, well, with that, now we've established I'm an idiot. Let us move on. <coughs> Any questions? I hope this helps with that problem. Yes. So, what are we talking about today? Physics. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a safe bet. Multi-dimensional motion. 
Uh, we are going to talk about motion in two or three dimensions. So kinematics in 2D or 3D. Okay, so what are the basic ingredients of um, kinematics? Well, we're studying the motion in principle of some particle, all right? But we use the particle concept as an abbreviation for larger things, right? Like maybe your particle's a car. Maybe your particle's a plane. Maybe your particle's an earth, right? So I would think of the earth as a particle if I don't care about all of its like internal motions, right? If I don't care about the rotation or any of that other fancy stuff that's going on. If I just want to think about it as kind of a like point in space that's moving through space around the sun, then conceptually I can think of the earth as a particle. This is the particle viewpoint. We just ignore substructure and just think about it as a point that's moving through space. So to describe a particle, you need a position function. A position function is simply a mapping. Um, for each time, you've got to give me a position. So this is the position at time t. All right. Now that assumes some kind of coordinate system. Talk more about later, but uh, now for two dimensions, what do you got? For 2D, we have R of t is what? X of t and y of t, right? And for 3D, our typical Cartesian coordinate description would be R of t. The position at time t is x of t, y of t, z of t. Now, I don't know about you, I sometimes get tired of writing all of the explicit time dependence, in which case it's nice we have shorthand, right? We can say the position is really, it's a vector of the x position, the y position, and the z position, right? So there you go, that's a, another notation we have. Now, once you have position, what else would you like to talk about? Uh, velocity, yeah. But even before that, you might want to talk about displacement. Okay, so, you know, schematically speaking, your motion might look like this, right? Maybe your motion looks like some kind of crazy, like, roller coaster nonsense. Maybe this is a, a fruit fly, you know, flying around, trying to avoid my $7 electric zapper from Walmart. Those also work on spiders. <laughs> it's a great joy. Electric feeding spiders are very fun. So, um, anyway, so I digress. So you could look at two different times. Okay, you could say R of one. So position one, that would be say R of T one, right? And then you could look at position two for this particle that's in motion. R of R two, which would be again R of T two. There's some particular time where you reach that position, right? And given two different positions at two different times, you can ask about the so-called what between these two positions? Displacement, right? Displacement is a what? Is a vector. Displacement is a vector. And so to get the displacement, the so-called delta R between these two guys, we take R two minus R one. So the displacement from R2 to R1, delta R, is R2 minus R1. And you can easily check that this equation is true. R1 plus the displacement vector delta R is equal to R2, right? If I start at R1 and then I add the displacement delta R, I get to R2. That's the way it works. Conversely, delta R is R2 minus R1. Okay. Not saying anything terribly profound yet. How about the distance traveled? What's the distance traveled between time one and time two? The arc, yeah, the arc length formula would give us the actual distance traveled. The straight line distance traveled is what? It's just the, what, the magnitude of the displacement, which is the length of this delta R vector, right? Yeah. Okay, let me move on here. So velocity, you guys are telling me I should talk about velocity. I'm, I'm going to take the bait. The velocity, then, is equal to the limit as delta t goes to zero 
of the displacement vector divided by the, the duration delta t. Now, of course, long story short, that's nothing more than dr dt, as we've discussed in a previous lecture, which can be understood in the same way in two dimensions as in three dimensions. You differentiate each component of the position function with respect to time. It's, that's either a dx dt comma dy dt, or it's dx dt comma dy dt comma dz dt, right? And so that's the instantaneous velocity. Is it a vector? The answer is yes. OK, so how about acceleration? Get to the point here, it's dv dt, right? So the change in velocity with respect to time is the acceleration. Again, a vector. So what's the relation between position, velocity, and acceleration in two or three dimensional motion? Well, some things we don't get to say anymore. Like last, when we talked about one dimensional motion, I did all this kind of Mickey Mouse stuff with graphs and areas under graphs. That stuff is kind of dead to us here. I mean, you could, I guess you could look at a bunch of graphs together and kind of piece information together, but nobody does that. Um, we pretty much just have to work at the level of vectors and accept our fate. All right, so. Um, but it's not bad. I mean, the vector, the vector formalism is very, very forgiving, very nice. Let me show you an example. So suppose the acceleration is constant. So suppose the acceleration is just equal to minus g, g I don't know, z hat, where g is constant. Constant with respect to time, of course. What that really means is that g dt is zero. Suppose that's the acceleration, constant acceleration. This is a three-dimensional problem, all right? And furthermore, let's suppose that the position at time zero is r naught, and the velocity at time zero is v naught. I mean, why not? Right? Now, so what I'm saying is that this r naught and v naught are specific given vectors of initial conditions. If you'd like, I could expand on these, get into the details. I'll do that just momentarily. Um, so like R naught would be traditionally X naught comma Y naught comma Z naught. All right. And the V naught vector, traditionally I would use the notation V naught is equal to V naught X, V naught Y, uh, V naught Z. But I think the notation which you know tells me both component dependence of those numbers as well as the you know the the event to which it's tied, which is the initial event, the knot for that. Yeah. Should our not be written with echo braces as well? Um, well I don't know. I mean you can make it if you want to. If it makes you happy. Does it not really matter though? Well I think of our I think of a position actually as a point in I mean this is the question. I mean I mean the question is this R1, right? Is it the position vector from the origin out to the point, or is it the point? Okay, so when I write um, not the angle bracket vectors, I'm really just thinking about it as a point. When I write the bracket vector, um, thinking of it as a directed line segment from the origin. That's how points <coughs> I mean, this, as I mentioned before, this discussion is somewhat pointless since you can do either one. Um, I mean, I don't know. Some of you are happier, like, preservation of notation. I start with angle brackets. I differentiate. I have angle brackets. So if that makes you, if that gives you a deep happiness of notation, by all means, use the angle brackets everywhere. Just keep in mind, you can, you can, you can, uh, certainly this is also a principle of notation. You can generate angle brackets from non-angle brackets. Right? So like if I take two points, a point P and a point Q, like so, in high school we learned, or whatever we learned, um, the vector from P to Q, right? The directed line segment from P to Q, this guy, is what? It's Q minus P, right? And I would argue that Q and P are points. So in this equation, on the one side you have angle brackets. On the other side, you have a difference of parenthetical vectors, right? 
don't try to attach too much meaning to these things. It's a notation for getting across a particular relation between vectors and three-dimensional space and points in three-dimensional space, right? I mean, there's nothing like super rigorous about only using one or the other. Although I will admit at various times in my life I've thought much more of it and, and felt righteous indignation for people using one thing or the other. But I think my energies were wasted. Okay. I think we have cleaned up the mess. Was that a pencil sharpener? Yeah. Okay. Yes, that'll happen. My wife has recently discovered electric pencil sharpeners in Germany. <laughs> so. Well, she was sharpening the pencils when I was a kid. Sharpening their pencils for the school, yeah, with a hand thing and like 50 pencils, and I'd just be like, it's never going to stop because I'd be like trying to watch whatever. Oh, I mean, you wouldn't know it's TV, but um, <laughs> that, that thing on the wall with images in it that you can just even watch. Um, okay, no. <laughs> I hope there's nothing to watch outside my window at night. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say something. Oh, oh, yes, okay, so, well, I got really distracted here. Coming back to the example, what is my goal? I want to find the velocity and the position as a function of time, given constant acceleration, and this initial position and this initial velocity. All right? How do you do it? The answer simply is integrate. So, if, if minus g z hat, is equal to g d d t. If you integrate both sides, what's that give you? It gives you v of t is equal to v naught minus g t z hat. You say, you didn't integrate. I, only, I did. I integrated in my head. And you're like, but you can't do that. It's integration. Well, yes, you can. Integration is educated guessing. I took an educated guess. This is the velocity function. Now, if you don't believe me, how would you check? Derived. Yes. Differentiate, yes. Or derive. So if I differentiate this, derivative of v naught, v naught's a constant, yes. So it differentiates to zero. This differentiates to what? d dt of minus g t z hat. Well, g is a constant, z hat's a constant, d t dt is one, so you just get back to minus g z hat. So simple as that. So there you go. There's the velocity of the function of time, just by anti-differentiating. And next, I have that um, v naught. Uh, um, well, notation here. Let me put the dr dt on the other side, just to be different. So dr dt is equal to v naught minus g t z. Yeah, all right. Again, I'm going to integrate both sides. The integral of the left-hand side is dr dt. The integral of the right hand side, well, I think if you tilt your head and squint, you can see that there's an r naught there. And then um, plus t v naught um, minus one half g t squared z hat. Now you could complain at this point that I just pulled the r naught from the thin blue sky. That's more or less true, <coughs> but it was an educated guess. Now, and you could have made the same complaint about v naught in the last step. Like, why did I write the constant of the integration as that in that perspective, you know? But the defense of my, my choice is simply illustrated by, by noting what? <coughs> v of 0 is what? v naught minus 0. So v of 0 is v naught, as we, as we need, right? And over here, in my second step, you can note that r of 0 is, guess what? It's R naught because the T V naught is zero and this is zero. So I get zero and zero here and so R naught when I plug in times zero. So I've shown that it, it fits the initial conditions and it has the right differentiation, right? If I differentiate it, get back to the, the velocity, right? Get back to the acceleration. Yep. How is this different from when we derive the same kind of equations for one dimensional motion? Well, this is different because everything I've written here is a vector. So I'm actually deriving three of those one-dimensional motion equations at the same time. Let me unwrap this for you. What does this really say? So 
so to unravel what I just wrote, let me say star and star star. Unwrapping star and star star. <clears throat> so we got V of D is equal to V dot uh, minus G T Z hat. All right. But what is this? This is um, Vx, Vy, Vz equals V dot X, V dot Y, V dot Z minus 0, 0, minus Gt. So that single star equation has within it these three equations. Vx is equal to V dot X. That's it. <laughs> Vy is equal to V dot Y. OK, exciting. Um, Vz is equal to V naught Z minus Gt. So these three scalar equations are all hidden inside that first star equation, right? So that's one difference. Yeah, it looks the same, but there's a lot hidden here. Where did you plus V? Well, there, there, there is a uh, error. And the error is either here or here. Where do you want it to be? There. there. OK. So there's some things we can take away from this silly example of mine. Maybe it's not so silly. It's like if I was to do this. Sorry. <laughs> that would be an example of this. So like the motion in the x and y direction was a constant vector in that direction, right? And it was only the z velocity which was changing, right? So that's actually an example. Um, I mean, I just illustrated an example. Sorry, I should probably like, get you to do some of these forms or something and then charge your battery with my marker. Um, free things. Free what? Free grades. Free grades? Everybody gets an A? Yeah, I'm injured, actually. Everybody gets an A. grading for me. <laughs> There's really only one person in this room who will object. <laughs> so this makes sense though. The acceleration here is just in the z direction, right? There's no acceleration in the y or the x direction, and that's why the velocity in the x and y directions were constant. Okay. Now star star, what's that give me? Well, I'm just going to jump straight to the point. A would give me x is equal to x naught plus v naught x times t. It gives me y is equal to y naught plus v naught y times t. And then z is the interesting one. It gives me z naught plus uh, v naught z times t minus 1 half gt squared. So there you go. Those are the kinematic equations for, well, three-dimensional motion with constant gravitational acceleration downward. It says if z is the uh, motion in which gravity is sees the direction for gravity right the up down, then ignoring friction, this the motion in the x and y direction is just straight line linear motion, just keeps going whichever direction it's going to start with and nothing stops it. It does not stop it, but it's stupid. Whatever. Questions about this? Now uh, of course I could, you know, we could work more interesting, mathematically interesting perhaps examples like Here's one. Suppose the velocity at time t, I'll do two dimensional, the t to the t cosine t, all right? And um, uh, the position at time zero is zero, zero. OK? Then I could say find r of t and the acceleration of time t. I mean, we did these kind of examples the other day. Let's see here. What we, what we get. I'll, I'll do the easy one first. The acceleration is dv dt, which is what? t to the t minus sine t. This is a dimensionally questionable problem, obviously. I'm missing all kinds of units. And I should really clutter it with multipliers to make the exponential something other than seconds. But anyway. I wrote some uh, lack of rigor on units. 
there, there's the example of acceleration, and then the position would be what? Basically, we integrate the at t, right? So what do we get? e to the t sine t, right? Plus some constant vector. And then plug in times zero. See, I couldn't do it in my head this time. I mean, maybe I could, but I didn't because maybe I could figure out what the constant of integration needed to be just in my head when I did the derivation of star and star star back here because they were simple. You know, I knew that plugging in times zero can make everything go away. Here, plugging in times zero doesn't make everything goes away. I mean, there's this e to the t left over, and that gets rid of the zero. So if that's equal to um, zero, zero, again, don't stuff the brackets. Um, that tells me that c is actually minus one zero. And so I find r of t is equal to e to the t minus one comma uh, sine t. Which we could unwrap, right? This gives me two equations. On the one hand, it tells me that x is equal to e to the t minus one. On the other hand, it tells me that y is equal to sine t. It's really not any more difficult than calculus one, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the same thing, just you have two copies of it going on, or three copies of it going on, right? But if you can differentiate and integrate one variable, you can just as well do it two or three times in a vector. consequence of its, its initial motion, right? So basically, when you throw a ball, you don't keep throwing it, right? You throw it, and then it, it travels, right? What brings it back down? Force of gravity, right? I mean, technically, there's also air resistance and other stuff. We ignore the air resistance aspect of it. So projectile motion is just the motion of bodies under the free fall influence of gravity. At, for us on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. Do you think an undergraduate will Get to the point where we take air resistance into account. Differential equation in this class? Did you do? Yeah, did you do? You could do it. Um, I mean, I could do it some in here. The trouble with friction is, it's not that, I mean, okay, partly the trouble is mathematical because um, friction is different for different things, right? So, um, you know, there's different, there's a different velocity dependence for friction at different, di different uh, regimes. Like, so maybe the velocity for certain motion depends linearly. Um, the friction force, rather, depends linearly with the speed at a certain uh, certain range of, of speeds, right? But then once you go a little bit faster, maybe it depends as like the, the square of the speed. There you're doing different math. And then maybe it's, maybe there's some kind of intertwining of those two different cases, right? And then, so how do you solve all of those different problems at once and then interlace them together? That would be something like we should have to do for friction. On top of all this, that's just a quantitative description, some sort of qualitative over, overview of what friction is. Friction is actually fantastically more complicated. Um, what actually causes friction for a given material body it depends on all, all kinds of complicated stuff, right? So that's why there's these people called engineers, the aeronautic engineers that, and they, a lot of them, they don't even do the math. They just build stuff and stick it in a tunnel and then blow smoke around it to see what happens. So <laughs> it seems like air frictions. I, that's a that's an area of current research. People are still trying to fine tune the mathematics to understand better how to understand friction of air flowing around things. And, um, yeah. So we can only do so much. We talked about friction in here. 
um, in the macroscopic boring, well, it's not boring, it's interesting. We will talk about friction after test one, static and kinetic. But there, the friction doesn't have any, we're not thinking about velocity dependent friction, I'm just talking about friction that is dependent on a particular coefficient that is a characteristic of the thing which is sliding and the thing which it's sliding on, um, the interface, basically how they, uh, those two materials interface, each material, pair of materials interfacing has a particular coefficient of friction and that coefficient is different whether the materials are moving or whether they're stationary. So we, we, we will use that later, but the, uh, the velocity dependent thing, we can solve some of those in different equations. I was fished in. All right, um, it's okay, that's actually a worthwhile question. So here's an example, so projectile motion. We're going to drop the third dimension here. So we'll do 2D. I think I have an example in the notes where I actually basically do this in 3D and not much different. But here's the basic kind of quintessential setup. Um, you got some guy. Sorry. Top hat, whatever. And um, shoots gun. And then the gun goes over here, whatever happens, happens. Um, so there's some some initial height he shoots it from, right? And you can say that he's the gun is initially at some initial position x naught. Um, usually we talk about the initial speed of the projectile, which I will illustrate as such. V naught, and then you give it some angle of inclination, which is this angle. And then you can ask fun questions like, how high does the thing go? How far does the thing go? If you put a cat, <laughs> that's a tall cat, I mean, so it's a large cat, you know, here. It's a monster. Does it, uh, does it clear the cat, or does the cat get what's coming to it? I mean, I usually make the cat a tree and ask you if it clears the tree, but we can make the tree a cat, I mean, why not? So there's all kinds of various fun um, twistings of this problem, and we will, of course, solve some of those in the lectures to come. Um, but for the moment, let me just talk about the basic setup. So if this is a situation, and we're talking about projectile motion, in other words, the only thing that's going on here is that the acceleration, right, is equal to zero minus g, or if you like, minus g y hat. So I'm talking about a two-dimensional system. We use x for horizontal, y for vertical. And this falls to us from on high. Um, I mean, it comes to us from the study of dynamics and um, constant approximations of non on constant things, and map. Truth be told, the acceleration due to gravity is not exactly constant. But two pretty good approximation if you're not too far away from the surface of the Earth that stays about 9.8 meters per second squared, right? But that's something that's derived from, um, let's say, a deeper truth, and it's universal law of gravitation. Um, now is that that's just a shadow of something deeper, perhaps? But uh, anyway, there you go. That's that's the kinematics. Kinematics are totally governed by that. The acceleration due to gravity is constant at minus g, minus 9.8. Sometimes the book uses 9.8 meters, 9.81 meters per second. I almost always will just use 9.8 meters per second squared here. I tell you, one of these semesters I'm changing it then. But um. Doesn't seem to be many people's custom to find the math. All right, so what are the kinematic equations here? Following the general derivation I just did for three dimensions, almost the same. We got what? We got v, we got x is equal to x naught plus v naught x times t. There is no x acceleration, right? So you've got constant motion in the x direction. Y is y naught plus v naught y times t. And then you got minus one half gt squared because what comes up must come down. So there's, a, there's an acceleration term there. Um, what else do we? What else can we say here? Well, that's where the fun comes in. V dot x and v dot y we can restate in terms of v naught and the angle. 
See, if you look up here at V0, you notice you can decompose that vector into two pieces. You got your x piece, do, 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 right? And you got your y piece, like so. So um, V0 vector is V0 x, x hat, plus um, V0 y, y hat. So what are these V0 x and V0 y? Well, right triangle trigonometry gives you T, right? So the x component, we get cosine theta, right? V0 cosine theta, the y component, um, V0 sine theta. And so you can come back down here and be a little more specific. What these formulas really say, x0 plus um, V0 cosine theta times T, and this other guy was y0 plus V0 sine theta times T, minus 1 half uh, GT squared. Now it's starting to get fun. How about the, what about the formulas for the velocity? Vx is what? V0 x, how about Vy? V0 y minus GT, right? But again, we can, we can rewrite those in terms of the angle, inc angle of inclination theta and the, um, the initial speed of the projectile would be not. So like V0 x is just V0 cosine theta again. V0 y is V0 sine theta um, minus GT. Now, some of you have the feeling, some of you have the feeling, you've kind of already done this. Well, yeah, you kind of already have done this because you've been studying one dimensional motion. So you have been playing with kind of half of this, right? Well, now there's two different things going on at the same time, and it's just more of the same. Um, so any questions about this before I take my next comment? Yeah. You're always treating like a cosine theta is not really like a constant or like really important formula since it's only like that effect that's like Yeah, here uh, V naught cosine theta and V naught sine theta for a fixed theta is a constant. Now you could ask questions like if you allow theta to vary, blah 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 blah, then theta wouldn't be a constant. You know? um, but here I think it's a constant, sure. Um, one question you could immediately ask is what's the maximum height? Right, so here's a good question. Maximum height. So, let's see here. What did you say? Differentiate the y. Yeah, we can set dy, we can set dy dt is equal to zero since y prime prime is equal to minus g, which is less than zero. That implies that this critical point will, in fact, correspond to a maximum by second derivative test, right? Probably that's how you can count this in here at some point or another. He's like, okay, for the calculus I'm not comfortable with. Well, that's your prior, but um, I mean, I would point out to you, physically speaking, what does this translate into? That says dy is equal to zero, right? So it, it always comes back to this to find the maximum of height. What comes up must come down, right? The highest it gets is when it stops going up and starts coming down, otherwise known as zero velocity. So I just have to say this guy equal to zero, right? Does that give me? Time, time equals what, as you say? E e not sine theta over g. E not sine theta over g. Okay, very good. And then what do I get? Say y uh, equals to y naught. So for max, max height, let's plug it into the y and see what happens. y equals y naught plus um, v naught sine theta times t, right? Well, t, t is v naught sine theta, though, right? And then I have to subtract minus 1 half g times v naught sine theta over g on v squared. So what do I get? I get y is equal to 
why not? If you notice here that we've got sine squared theta on both of those terms, um, the first one I've got g, the second one I've got g over 2. So 1 minus a half is, is a half. So what I have then is plus v naught squared over 2g, um, and then times the sine squared of theta. There you go. That's the max height. The initial height plus v naught squared sine squared theta over 2g. Now let's go back to the question about, well, what if you, could you change the angle? Well, yeah, let's think about changing angle. When do you get maximum height? 45 degrees? Degree year. Right. Dangerous for cannon fire. Um, <laughs> also for, for guns, you remember the popular talk about commercial a number of years ago about the bullets featuring this 90 degree scenario. Shoot straight up, they can come back down. Fortunately, the, uh, the air friction actually does play a role there, and so we don't know. Maybe you can make the rotation of the earth. Like rotation, rotation of the earth, yeah. That's a good question. How much does the rotation of the earth figure into like small caliber hand weapons um, shot straight up into the air? What's the uh, What's the word? Coriolis, yes, what's the Coriolis drift? I don't know. I, I really don't know. The Mythbuster did something about that, and the bullets were laying miles off. I'm not sure. It's almost like going to shoot it up in the air and fall straight back down. The Mythbuster says it's rough. But then the question is how much of that is, like, you know, wind? It's just a yeah, local wind. wind. Yeah. What's the Coriolis effect you have to do on set? So for those of you who don't know what they're talking about, the Coriolis effect is the fact that the Earth is turning, right? So if you shoot something straight up, the Earth is literally turning under it, right? And that is not taken into account in any of these formulas. These formulas pretend like the Earth is just some giant flat sheet, and gravity goes straight down, and it's not turning or anything, right? The Coriolis effect takes into account that rotation of the Earth. Um, but yes, there is more Coriolis effect for one kind of motion versus another. It's, it's complicated. Would there be a point, though, like once it hits like the atmosphere, but then it hits space and then it comes out the atmosphere? Oh, well, that, well that, that brings us to the other issue. Is like, if it hits space, it won't come back down. Well, if gravity is really minus g, everything comes back down eventually. You can't escape it. Like, it's always pulling on you. But that's not the truth. The real acceleration due to gravity is something more like minus g mass of the air divided by r, okay? We are squared. It's something more like that, where this is the distance from the center of road. Right? And so, um, in fact, this is not constant. In fact, this gets weaker, more and more weak the further and further you go out, tending to zero, right? So in fact, it is possible to throw something so fast that it escapes this acceleration. That's called the escape, escape velocity, right? If you have greater than the gravitational energy, which things are bound to the air, if you get more than that magic number, then there's a marker, it just keeps going. So later in the course, I'll ask a question. Uh, Superman throws a bowling ball straight up at the air, 10,000 meters per second. How high does it go? Where does this question make sense? Where does it come back down? I mean, I'll try to make the wording so you can't no get away with not doing math or physics. Is this during the daytime or the nighttime? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll do more of this next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the time. Well, I'm Oh, lab! I need your labs. Turn in your labs. Oh, put them on the table up there.